Would you pray with me? Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, Lord our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, back to reality. We've had the meals and the gifts and the cookies, the music and the movies. Did you get to watch your favorite Christmas movie? Oh, sad face. Some of you got toys. Some of you got electronics, which are the same thing as toys. Books. We've had a break from the normal grind, but soon it'll be time to get back to normal. And our backdoor guests, Mary and Joseph, remind us today about that. I mean, Christmas Eve is all angels and shepherds and things are magical, as they are for most of us when we get to finally hold the baby that we've been expecting for so long. And then... Well, the shepherds have to go back to find their sheep, and the angels depart, and even the innkeeper has a 10 o'clock checkout because he's got to turn the room around for the next set of guests. And it's just you and a crying baby. Normal, right? Luke and Matthew, in their two Gospels, actually tell us two different stories about the early days and months of Jesus' life. The lectionary text for today from Luke chapter 2 tells it this way. When eight days had passed, Jesus' parents circumcised him and gave him the name Jesus. This was the name given to him by the angel before he was conceived. When the time came for their ritual cleansing, in accordance with the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. They offered a sacrifice in keeping with what stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. A man named Simeon was in Jerusalem. He was righteous and devout. He eagerly anticipated the restoration of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. The Holy Spirit revealed to him that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Led by the Spirit, he went into the temple area. Meanwhile, Jesus' parents brought the child to the temple so that they could do what was customary under the law. Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God. He said, Now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. You prepared this salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed by what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This boy is a sign to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that generates opposition, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your innermost being too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, who belonged to the tribe of Asher. She was very old. After she married, she lived with her husband for seven years. She was now an 84-year-old widow. She never left the temple area, but worshiped God with fasting and prayer night and day. She approached at that very moment and began to praise God and to speak about Jesus to everyone who was looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Mary and Joseph had completed everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to their hometown, Nazareth in Galilee. The child grew up and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Today is my daughter's birthday, and so I've got babies and newborns on the brain, um, and I always do this time of year. We took our newborn to church when she was eight days old. We didn't know any better. But also, I was uh, still recovering from childbirth, and everybody wanted to hold her, of course. And I was all kinds of ways. I was so proud. I was so much still in pain, and I was so nervous. And I remember telling Mildred, who was herself a mother of seven, seven children, and she wanted to hold my baby, and you know what I said. I said, hold her head. <laughs> she looked at me like, do you not think I know to hold a newborn baby's head? So it makes me happy to think of Jesus being brought to the temple as a newborn, doing the things that most of us do, we want the world to know we've done this amazing thing. There's a new person in the world, and we were part of that. And those of you who are adoptive parents also know that thrill of being able to bring your child home and introduce your, your new baby to the world, your new person in your family, and how much love you already have to share, and you want the world to rejoice with you. Joseph and Mary offered two turtle doves. That's the offering that poor people would bring. You see, from the very beginning, Luke wants us to see just how much Jesus is identifying with the poor. And two old people, Simeon and Anna, are also in the temple. And the Holy Spirit speaks to Simeon, and he asked to hold the baby. And I'm sure Mary said, hold his head, and, and gave him the baby. But at that point, Simeon was only listening to the angels as he offered a blessing over the baby. I can go now, Lord. You've let me see your salvation. Anna, too, who lived at the temple, offers a prophetic word over the newborn. Now, you and I know that our newborns are the best thing that has ever happened to us and therefore to the world. And so when other people compliment us on how beautiful our babies are, and I can still remember saying to my husband, I know you're supposed to believe your baby is beautiful, but ours really, really is, and, and she was and is to this day. We're justifiably amazed and proud. Mary and Joseph are also amazed to hear these things said about their child. I mean, I believe my baby was a gift to the world, but theirs really was the gift to the world. The Bible says he grew and became strong. He grew in stature, he grew physically, and he grew in wisdom. He grew he grew and he grew up, and he was filled with God's favor. That's Luke's story, and probably most of us can touch that story at some level. But Matthew also has a story, and in many places around the world, it's that story that rings true to real life. It's terrifying. Joseph receives a word from God in a dream that they need to flee their home because Herod the tyrant is in a murderous rage. They escape to Egypt, being not the first nor last, but maybe simply the most well-known refugee family who has to flee their home because of the madness of a ruler. Herod had all the boy babies killed to make sure none of them would grow up to challenge his throne. Herod had members of his own family killed to make sure none of them would challenge his throne. Church, when dictators tell you who they are, believe them. Believe. It was true for Herod. It's the scariest part of the story to me, the remembrance of the of Jerusalem was slaughtered by the Babylonians, the reference to Rachel, the mother of Israel, weeping for the children who were no more. We've talked about this during this Advent season. These stories are true in every age, 
and we can immediately call in our minds the places in the world where children are not safe. Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, being one of those places today where mothers and fathers are again inconsolable. This is what it means to get back to reality. A world in which both things are true. New babies are here. The older generation sees in them the promise, the hope, life renewing itself. Simeon and Anna reveal to us that Jesus will be the salvation of God. And that's true. And it's also true that not all babies are safe. Not all families are able to live where they want, in safety, away from murderous dictators. This is our world. Jesus' coming has begun the process of bringing the kingdom of God, but that work is not yet complete. We are in the in-between time between that first and second final coming of Jesus. God's coming to earth as one of us in the Christ. The theological word for that is incarnation. That literally means God taking on flesh. It's a mystery. As I said last week, in in the same way that at creation, all that has ever been and ever will be in the universe was put into the smallest possible moment of space and time, which exploded at the voice of God. So in Jesus, God and humanity meet. Now, I can't explain it biologically. I can't even explain it with string theory. I just believe it. In Jesus, God and humanity meet. The writing of all that has gone wrong has begun. And we trust and believe that there will be a day when the age that has begun in Christ will be fulfilled, when God's reign on earth will be finally and fully lived into. Meanwhile, we are in between those two events. We're in the in-between times. And in the in-between times, even Jesus needs his diapers changed. So we have work to do, and that's what it is to live in between the times. Our work is to be part of the restoring of the world that Jesus began. Where there's hunger or poverty or brokenness or despair, where people are unaware of their own purpose and possibility in life, where all the tomorrows look the same as all the yesterdays, that's where we go with love to be part of the good news. We show up like Jesus did to offer love and forgiveness to all who would receive it. That's a big job. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Remember the wisdom attributed to the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Somewhere between the diapers and the end of the age is where our work lies, one day at a time, one person at a time, one diaper at a time, what I often call the next right thing to offer Jesus again and again to the world. Dan Sadlier, who's a pastor in New York, wrote, Christianity can be pretty confusing, but the way of Jesus is clear. This is what he said is the way of Jesus. Move toward the poor, empower women, create space at the table, throw parties, widen the family boundaries, Poke holes in oppressive systems. Don't retaliate with violence. Forgive your enemy. Don't store up wealth. Be present with people. Heal, announce. Push back darkness. The kingdom of God is near. Church, I love Christmas. 
I love the meaning of Christmas, the mystery, the magic, the lights, and the promise, and the hope. I love Jesus more than I love Christmas. And I trust that you do too. And Jesus does not stay in the manger. He goes to the temple. He grows in stature. And he grows up. He grows in wisdom. He begins to understand the call on his life, the purpose and opportunity to announce and bring forth the reign of God, to invite as many people as he can to do that with him, one person at a time. So we don't stay at the manger either. We go with the wise men to seek him, finding generally he's already one step ahead of us, but leaving us a path to follow, a path of wisdom and sacrifice, of friendship and forgiveness, of water and wine poured out, of bread broken and shared, hands held, of song and prayer, hammers and nails, casseroles and, yes, diapers, one person at a time, one day at a time, together. Welcome to the way of Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.